Well, welcome everyone to the first webinar of eSmart Week 2017. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jeremy Blackman. I'm the Senior Advisor for Cyber Safety at the Alana and Madeline Foundation. A lot of my work, of course, revolves around young people and the way they use technology. And today we're going to be looking at uh, basically what's trending for young people online, particularly also why, what the, what the why is, why they use uh, social media platforms. Uh, what they're using, which ones they're using, and also hopefully give you a number of resources that you'll find useful uh, in your dealings with young people. So for those of you who don't know much about the foundation, very quickly I'll give you an overview. Um, this is actually our 20th year in operation, um, which is a great, great thing, and uh, I guess our work revolves around three main areas, prevention being probably our biggest area, which involves great programs like these smart schools, these smart libraries, uh, the digital license, of course, many of you may know. But also we work in care, uh, working directly with families, a team of social workers, uh, and a number of other areas uh, such as buddy bags. And of course, another big area we work in is advocacy. eSmart Week, I guess, is a manifestation of that, but we also um, work with various government agencies, including the Safety Commissioner. Uh, in, in areas uh, that pertain to young people and their safety. So it's a privilege to work for the foundation, of course, and uh, particularly in something as that's generated as much interest as eSmart Week. So as I mentioned, I want to give you a bit of insight into the latest research and the trends, what kids are doing online and why. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the why. I always ask the question why, not just the what, but what's, what's driving these behaviours. And we'll finish with uh, some resources that I hope you'll find useful. So I've kind of outlined 10 reasons as to why social media is popular. For some older generations, it can be a little bit baffling as to how much enthusiasm young people show towards social media and how much of, a, of their world it is now, of course. They, they really don't distinguish between online and offline in the way that we do. Uh, we, by we, I mean old generations, because while I don't really like the term digital natives, uh, it's true in as much as uh, their kind of attitude towards technology in that it's not an add-on. It's, it's completely seamless, um, and, and particularly regards to their social world. It's, they have, they often, you often see young people having social, face-to-face -face social interactions at the same time as they're having online uh, interactions. So, um, I guess the first reason I really identified was this yo-yo craze effect, uh, you know, also known as it's popular because it is, or you might hear that word, you know, it's gone viral or kind of virality. And um, I've linked it to that idea of the yo-yo because it's something that I really relate to as a memory of myself at school. Uh, you know, you might have been, I don't know, grade four or grade five, suddenly some of the students have yo-yos, they bring yo-yos to school and everyone, within a week everyone has them. And you have to have them, and you have to collect the Coca-Cola one, the Fanta one, and, and they're all across the school, people doing tricks with yo-yos, you know, rock the cradle and walk the dog. And then a few weeks later, all the yo-yos have gone, replaced with something else. And, you know, it's one of those kind of things that happens in waves. And maybe two years later, they all come back again inexplicably. So social media is a lot like that. There's many, many platforms out there for social media, and young people move between them very quickly. So something that's very popular, uh, suddenly overnight uh, the youth communities leave it for something else. Uh, and it can be for many reasons, but many of which, uh, you know, often it's difficult to understand as to what the exact reason is. Maybe there's no particular reason. But of course a lot of it's to do with that second point. It's social and it's social media. Of course that's the main purpose and it's about connecting with people and it's going where your peer group is. Of course, they're free to use notionally, and for young people, it's all about about the literal definition of that in terms of money. We go, they go online, and and not being generally speaking, especially preteens and younger teenagers, they're not earning money, so so it's free to use. Uh, of course, we can have conversations with them, uh, very valuable conversations with them around around data and the collection of data and the way that's used for advertising, etc in terms of um, maybe it's not so free, maybe we're a commodity on these platforms, but at least in terms of money it's free and for them that's, that's the priority. 
Uh, the fourth point there, so they're accessible, they're mobile, they're quick, they're simple, they're fun. So of course smartphones have really, really amplified that, that the importance of their mobility. Um, the, the story that always comes to my mind with that accessibility is, and the, especially the quick and simple aspect of it is, we I run a number of, I've organized a number of youth panels over the years, and I remember one in particular where we had a year 10 student as one of the, the panelists in a room of 250 uh, conference attendees. And we're talking with this youth panel, and after 15 minutes we realized, despite being very, very engaged in the conversation and giving great insights, this year 10 student had been using a phone under the desk, and we're like, wow, that's, that's kind of sneaky and interesting. So we said, what, what's, why, why, what's, what's, what have we been doing on the phone this time, all this time we've been talking? And so oh, I've just been texting friends, um, you know, sending messages, organizing, maybe when we'll catch up next. And we said, oh, right, okay, so how many, how many messages have you sent over the last 15 minutes? And he said, he had a look at his phone and said, oh, about 120. And, you know, the whole room was, was shocked. How, how can you send that many messages while you were doing something else, no less? And, of course, all the messages were one, two, three words, uh, just very quick exchanges, simple exchanges. And, of course, now you can uh, use emojis, the GIFs, the little, um, you know, quick little videos to express an emotion or an idea. So, yeah, so that kind of idea of the accessibility of social media platforms is, is a huge motivator. And I guess a modern day equivalent is up to the yo-yo is the fidget spinner. Some of you might have seen this doing the rounds. Serves as a great example of that yo-yo craze effect. I think it's gone now. I think it's pretty much gone. You know, it's come and gone within three months, and now they're onto something else. So uh, that's the modern yo-yo. Uh, this is also, a co of course, a very strong motivator for young people uh, on social media is that the fact that these these spaces are adult free or at least shielded. And for those of us who didn't grow up in this era, we probably spent a lot more time in physical spaces away from adults, spending whole days at the park or in the arcade or and, and while they still do some of that, I think I think increasingly their physical world is shrinking, especially young people growing up in cities. And uh, the substitute for that in many cases is online communities and especially gaming communities. You know, they they're potentially limitless physical spaces, in, you know, in inverted commas, in the online world, and they can very easily organise for that to be adult-free. Of course, along with that comes comes issues of inappropriate content and contact with strangers, perhaps, or people that, that don't want to to be involved with. So that, of course, it comes with risks. Six through nine, so looking at kind of celebrities and heroes, this is a big thing. You know, young people follow as, as, as adults do. You know, we follow our heroes who are in the public eye, in those, on these public platforms, these public social media platforms, and Twitter's still a, a big place for that. Um, as we've seen with recent political events worldwide, I suppose, and how that's being used, but, but they follow their celebrities on, online as well, which of course comes with that fear of missing out too. They're seeing things that they're their, their friends are doing. Maybe they're going to rock to you know pop concerts, uh, and they're seeing they're seeing all these activities happening all at once uh, in in the community or around the world even. And it can it can have a negative effect in that way, but largely positive. They're largely you know following their celebrities and heroes and and seeing what they. And actually now you can on Twitter for example you can you can if you if you say follow a tweet from Ariana Grande, you know, and you can see a live update as to how that, that tweet is being retweeted, how many times, who's, how many times it's being replied to and liked. And it's quite amazing to see the volume um, for some of these worldwide celebrities, the volume of interaction on social media. Also, good to, good to remember that, you know, of course, risk-taking is a part of growing up. And I guess in... That, you know, social media platforms, young people do see them as environments that are kind of safe enough. Um, they avoid one-to-one, face-to-face -to -face kind of contact. So I think we often don't give them enough credit for being savvy in that way, and they are risk-taking. But of course, with all youth risk-taking, uh, inevitably it can lead to, to a big mistake. 
And of course, we're all about uh, trying to minimise that risk, trying to educate young people that there are certain risks that shouldn't be taken or, or if something does happen, to, to know what to do and know who to turn to. But um, they do largely see these environments as, as safer places to take risks. And of course, that eighth point, you know, trying on identities. I think in the early days of social media, MySpace being the kind of archetypal social media platform, um, where actually as part of its marketing campaign, it was very much a message about doing exactly that. Have multiple accounts, try on identities, uh, use each use each of your accounts to focus on a different aspect of your passions, whether it was music, whether it was well, you know, fashion or or sport. And I think lately we've seen a diminishment of that because social media platforms are trying to enforce real name policies and and being who you say you are and having one account per platform. So I think there's a, a slight reduction in that aspect of social media, but we still see it, especially in terms of anonymous platforms, and there's many, many of those. Number nine, of course, conformism with a peer group, fitting in, always a strong driver for young people, and of course relates very closely to the social aspect of it. The image you see on the right there, it's a little bit random, a bit antiquated, uh, it's from the turn of the century, early 20th century, when uh, the telephone had really started to, to make its way across the globe. And of course, these are young young women who are telephone operators. And the reason I give that example is because it's it does it, you know it serves us well to remember that most of the time with with this, it's not about the technology itself, but it's about human behaviours. And this was an example of uh, you know for many of these young women, it was their first professional job. They had a sense of independence for the first time, and there was a huge moral panic actually that swept across media and it swept across society that these young women for the first time could organise meetings with potential suitors completely unknown to their parents and to those that maybe had their welfare at heart. So there's a very big moral panic about, about the risks associated with that and of course many of us with that example will think of modern day practices of, of um, you know, sexting for example and, and the risks associated with that. So this is, you know, I guess, an earlier version of that, where, where suddenly the technology, and the, you know, gave, gave the opportunity to, for young people to have more independence, and that goes to that one of my earlier points about an adult-free environment that they're they're seeking. And the last reason is that idea of a new generation and defining, to defining yourself as being part of that generation. Um, I might have mentioned earlier I'm a Gen Xer, proud Gen Xer, born in the mid 70s, and for my generation, I bring up the the Pepsi example. Pepsi, of course, was trying to trying to really replace the dominance of of Coke in that soft soft drink industry, and trying to trying to use that that hook of don't do what past generations have done. Define yourself by this this new thing. Um, and of course, the image on the right is of Nirvana, which was they released their their seminal album in 1991, which was my year 12 year, and of course, you know that really defined our year. It was a very nihilistic, angry, full of attitude kind of uh, music that even the year before us hadn't been privy to. hadn't um, It was a turning point, and we really leapt onto that, and the whole year level was. Pretty much was very much loyal to that to that band and their messages. So we can talk about in grand sweeping statements about about generations, generation X, generation Y, the millennials, etc., which captures um, a generation across a number of years. But actually, if we go to a micro level, it's even more specific than that. And if you if you hang out with someone who was I don't know four or five years. Uh, difference in age to you, you'll find, of course, big gaps in their in their um, experiences or differences in their experiences, especially around pop culture, because it moves so quickly. And the same is true of social media. You know, I've I talked earlier about MySpace. That will be completely foreign. <laughs> you know, to to the, the probably probably the last what seven or eight years of 
of young people growing up on social media. They won't have had those ex early experiences of what of what um, what MySpace was all about. Um, and they'll have their own experiences, and increasingly, it's moving more to, to messaging apps and to, to a different kind of social media, which I'll which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. So that there are the ten reasons, and I guess the next thing I want to cover was four main types of social media and what they do. And I think this is again, it's a way of framing, it's a way of framing social media and the way young people use it, rather than that's very overwhelming concept of trying to have a handle of what all the emerging apps are, what they're using and why, um, which even for us in the industry is pretty much impossible because there's so many platforms. Yes, there are more popular ones, but it really depends on the youth community as to what, which ones they're using. And, and it's better to think of it in terms of types rather than each one's different. And really there's lots of crossover in these types. So it's, it's pretty handy and I hope this will be useful for you. So messaging apps, um, really, really in the past, uh, I guess three years, this has been the transition away from traditional social networking platforms to messaging apps, and there's a number of reasons for that. But I've listed some of the key features or appeal there. Free again, of course. Um, disappearing messages was pione pioneered by Snapchat, that second icon with the little ghost with the tongue. And really, disappearing messages gave that idea for the first time of privacy, of privacy basically, which again is probably a notional privacy. Um, lots of controversy had surfaced around what Snapchat was doing with data, and how you could save images and save messages. Um, but really, the promise was that you, you would send you would send an image and it would disappear within. You could choose within three, five, or, or ten seconds, and it was gone forever. And you could you could have some fun with that in various ways, and be assured that that the message was gone, and you could restart. So that's that functionality is now crossing over into many of these. SMS is now trialing it. So a number of these platforms are trialing that idea of of disappearing messages. So going from left to right. So Kick Messenger, Snapchat, WhatsApp, uh, Viber, SMS, AskFM, and Saraha. Some of you might have heard of Saraha recently. AskFM and Saraha are set up to be anonymous messaging apps, along with Kick Messenger in many ways. And um, that that idea of anonymity and a notional privacy is very appealing for for young people. So they also are multimedia driven now. Text, images, video, GIFs, emojis, all kinds of, and live streaming even now is coming up as a, as a really important new feature, live streaming of videos. And the smartphone, of course, is making all of this very possible and easier. Uh, I mentioned before that, that example of the year 10 student on the panel, super fast, brief exchanges. It's not, not about, you know, it's, I think in our world, in our working world anyway, you know, we deal in maybe longer emails, maybe emails that are longer than they should be, um, but they're very text heavy. So not so with these messaging apps. They're super fast. They're, they're quick. They're, they're pithy and witty. Um, sometimes rude, I guess. Uh, potentially nasty apps are those anonymous. We've had a lot of issues. Um, dealing with those kinds of the issues that arise out of anonymous apps, so because they're often really they're set up to to draw feedback on an idea or on a on a user, and and because they're anonymous, it really does. All the research has shown that it really does diminish empathy in a big way, and and that kind of even if it's set up to for the users to give each other constructive feedback. Of course, with anonymity comes, you know, human nature being what it is, a constructive very quickly turns to, to abusive, uh, to be honest. So, uh, so that's that's messaging apps. Social networking platforms, I mentioned a bit more, I've been around for a bit longer. Um, there are crossovers, but essentially the key features of these live streaming videos is is bigger on social networking platforms still, just because of their of the way that they're used um, through the the mobile apps tend to be a lot more robust in that way in their capability. 
so they still have multimedia, all these different aspects. Um, Lively is the example on the far right. So if we're going through from left to right, Instagram, Musical.ly, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Tumblr, Twitter, and that last one, Lively, which actually uses the Musical.ly platform um, to run live streams, live video streams. You can imagine the appeal of live streaming. You know, uh, there's a term actually uh, called uh, life streaming, which was the, that idea that young people update their followers on social media uh, as, to, as to what they're doing live as it's happening. So for example, if you think about it on Twitter, little short messages, uploading um, where they are, if they're at a concert, what's happening, uh, photos of it. And now, of course, with videos, it's actually, you can watch that happening as if you're looking through their eyes. So that whole idea of live streaming is, is made even more real and immediate by video streaming. So really keep an eye out on that one. It's it's a bit of a game changer. In the same way Pokemon Go was a game changer with augmented reality earlier this year. Um, free. There's that free again. Um, data sometimes means it's not free, but I think even even that more and more young people are you know, not constrained by by data maximums on their their phone deals. Um, data's becoming, you know, um, much more flexible in that way. And image filters, of course, there's lots of fun to be had on a lot of these platforms like Instagram. Instagram did a lot of pioneering in this regard, as well as Snapchat, it has to be said, in image filters. And they're lots, lots of fun as well. The third one is games and gaming worlds. I won't talk too much about this, <coughs> but, but really Clash of Clans, um, some of you might recognize that second one, which is Plants vs. Zombies. It's been around for quite a few years now, but is a classic and it's still there, it's still popular. League of Legends, one of the world's most popular games. Uh, and I've put in an example of uh, a console, a game console, PlayStation, because really most games that young people play now can connect or by default connect to an online community and PlayStation's no different. Uh, whereas once it was just a console completely removed from the internet, it's now, you know, it's used as an actual, um, a gateway to the internet and many communities happen on those gaming worlds. Pokemon Go I mentioned before is the one next to that, um, really pioneering augmented reality, and Minecraft of course is the one on the right, and that's still very popular, uh, particularly with pre-teens and younger. And of course the ma major appeal of these, of gaming worlds, is that they hang out with friends, chat rooms, uh, they can hang out with a number of friends at the same time rather than just one-to-one, -one. They're immersive worlds, they get lost in them, there's escapism in many ways, but also like, it gives them long periods of time where they can hang out with friends and, and explore things and create things. So lots of, lots of positives, heaps and heaps of positives. And of course there's a negative, potential for negative things too. You know, are they uh, addictive and compulsive? And we, we don't want to throw the word you know, addiction around too loosely, but but it's some of these online gaming worlds because they're so immersive and and engaging. Um, long young people can spend long periods of time on them, um, and it can quickly start to interfere with their the balance of their the rest of their lives. And I think once when you're starting to talk about addictions, I think that's probably a key differentiator. Like a healthy enthusiasm for something versus an addiction is when really that. There, it really starts to interfere with their, the rest of their life, and they can't control it. And finally, secret and hidden and dating apps, which you probably should know know about, and have conversations with young people about them. So, um, the the key cap there that I've, I've surrounded by a red circle. That's just an example. There's many, many of these, but this is an example of one of them. And and really, what it is is it's like a facade. It has the it has the appearance of a calculator, but once you click into it and then give you a password, it opens up the actual home screen and or a second home screen and what all those and that's where all the apps they're they're using or want to keep hidden are. So again, it's that it's appealing to that adult free shielded nature of it. And young people are very good at hiding in plain sight. You know, they'll they'll have their default home screen and they'll be open about that, but but um, there are ways that they can actually hide their, their main activities. So it's something not to, rather than monitoring 
um, in an invasive way, it's having conversations regularly about, about what kinds of apps they're using um, in a non-confrontational way to start with. Um, the moment it turns, those kind of conversations turn formal is, is probably the moment that they start to, to become suspicious and defensive. Um, and of course the dating apps is about meetups and they really utilise geolocation software uh, which is becoming a lot more sophisticated. Um, some slightly disturbing developments lately have been with examples of say Tinder aiming at a younger teenage demographic. Um, really focused on on those you know getting yeah, offering that opportunity to meet up with young other younger people, but but um, of course there's risks, pretty clear risks inherent in that, um, and they're using geolocation and and they often use ratings as well as a mechanism, a key feature. So rating other people, rating locations, and and um, that. That is kind. Of, I guess ratings is a, a feature of our broader society now. Everything from, you know, from Uber experiences to, to restaurant experiences, and that's crossing over into to dating apps and to um, those kinds of apps where you meet up with people and, and rate them. So they're the four technological convergence. I don't want to scare you too much with with these kinds of concepts, but really we've talked about a lot already. It's just a, a way of naming it. So. Technological convergence, that idea that technology, as technology changes, different technology systems evolve towards performing similar tasks. So I've talked a lot about the way that, for example, um, the way that Snapchat pioneered disappearing messages and now SMS is trialling it, and pretty soon we'll have a lot of these messaging apps and platforms using that same disappearing messages technology. I've given it as an example there. If you think about some other examples, in the mid 20th century, TV converged uh, the technology of radio and movies. Um, you know, you didn't have to go out to the drive-in anymore or just listen to the radio. It was a combination of both on the television. Um, now, TV has been converged, of course, with smartphones and the internet with streaming services. Uh, and other ones include the way GPS is used across different platforms. Um, the way music is. I, I gave an example before of Musical.ly, the app, which is essentially a, a lip-syncing, a lip-syncing community, shall we say, where you lip-sync to your favourite pop song, upload it uh, to the app, and everyone can view it and rate it. So, of course, it's interacting with that kind of music, in a interacting directly with the user um, and the user community. Photo filters, of course, are being used across many platforms now. And augmented reality, we're really just starting on that on that path now. In terms of having conversations with young people, um, there's been a bit of a development lately in privacy terms. We often complain about um, how uh, intractable, I guess, or impenetrable some of these privacy terms and conditions are, and we just kind of we tick them without reading them. But Snapchat and a couple of other companies have have actually translated, I guess you could say, their privacy terms into plain spoken language. So it's really actually a great chance to go through the basic, the basic outline of those terms and and use it as an entree into into having those conversations with young people. So if you look at this one, Snapchat, you know, the information we collect, there are three basic categories of information we collect. And the first one right away, information you choose to give us. So it's a great a great first point to have a conversation with young people about what kinds of information that you, would you share, where would it, where would it go, um, and and so on. So information we get when you use our, uh, when you use our services, and information we get from third parties. And I think that's that third third parties point is a really a good conversation starter too. So so the idea that if you're using Snapchat, you also download an app produced by a different company called SnapSave. Which lets you save um, a message or an image on Snapchat, um, but the moment you the moment you sign the terms and conditions of the third party, of course, you're giving them access to to very you know to your data that you're sharing as well. So and you don't, and Snapchat interacts with that third party in all kinds of ways that that you may not know about. So. Um, the five letter term down at the bottom of this slide, COPPA, the Ch uh, Children's Online Protection and Privacy Act, is that law that basically states 
that companies aren't allowed to collect data from minors, so those children under the age of 13, which is why there's that kind of blanket law or blanket um, ter terms and conditions on social media platforms that you have to be 13 plus. Some are 16 or 17 plus even, but, but this is where the 13 plus rule comes in. So that's there to protect the data of minors. Of course, we know that a lot, a lot of minors are on these platforms. Um, so in, in many ways, it doesn't work, at least in, in reality. So having those conversations is so important. So I guess some advice to finish off. And I like to talk about all the little moments. And I think the main, my main point here is that technology now with smartphones and how mobile it is, how accessible and inviting it is and how amazing it is, uh, can quickly become the default and just fill up every spare moment. So think about it in those terms, especially family in terms of family routines. Um, all those little moments we filled up with technology and really you add them all up and they, they, they either add up to significant periods of time or even if you can't add them all up to those big periods of time, you can make them more meaningful um, and technology free um, just by default. So a way of doing that is you know, treat smartphones like, like a TV and PlayStation when you're at home. You know, smartphones do everything. Most kids will choose social media and games, but have by default tech-free times and just build them in, embed them into, into family lives. So for example, there's lots of worry these days that kids aren't reading um, or some you know, struggle to read or to replace technology with reading or reading in different forms even. So you know, Sunday morning, first thing, quiet reading or no technology ever at family dinners and breakfasts, just an expectation, and internet-free homework. And, you know, kids will argue that they need the internet to do their homework, and it might be true to, a, to an extent, but they don't need it on in the background all the time. They might need it to download something, to upload something, to research something, but trying to make that internet use targeted and for a certain amount of time rather than just having it on in the background all the time, because there is a constant temptation, and, and every adult can relate to that as well. Actually, I, before I go on, I should say, the image on the right there was a, is a classic one. Some of you might recognize it, and it kind of sums up, sums up in many ways the, the dis, distraction capability of technology. Here are, here are these teenagers in an art gallery, this masterwork in the background covering a whole wall pretty much and they're, they're distracted by their devices. But actually this was part of a, a marketing campaign for an art gallery, believe it or not. Um, and it was a whole sequence of images as part of that campaign. And what they're actually doing is, is interacting with the art through these devices, finding out all about the artist and, and the kind of painting techniques that, that he used and biographies and all kinds of things. So, so unfortunately it went viral for the wrong reason. Um, but it's, you know, its origin is still known. And um, yeah, it's a kind of interesting talking piece as, as an image and as an idea. So just a summarize, just summarizing that kind of main advice, learn the main categories of apps and games and the, and the key functionality and where that overlaps, that convergence. Don't learn everything that's out there, impossible, overwhelming for all of us. Main categories. And that way you can have conversations with young people in your lives about the kinds of the kinds of things they're doing and what's what's interesting. You know, I mean, some of you may have used the GIF library, for example, in your texts. For those of you who have iPhones, some of you may not have even downloaded or be aware of it. Be a gen, you know, cultivate that curiosity, the genuine interest in, in what kind of tech is emerging. You don't have to, again, you don't have to know all of it. Just little bits and pieces gives you an entree into into some of it, and that's a lot of fun. And it gives you the opportunity to, to have conversations, to, you know, you only need just, you only, only need just the ability to enter the conversation. You don't need to, and you'll learn a lot, but if it's, if it's all a mystery, then very difficult. So don't close the door on it, open the door a little bit. Keeping up to date with those categories and emerging technologies, you can subscribe and regularly check information on some of those websites, which I'll give you on the next slide. And they'll, you know, even just having two or three subscriptions, and they'll ping you every every few days or, you know, every week with some things that are happening out there in tech world. 
And here are some of those websites. I, of course, we massively recommend the eSafety Commissioner's website. Uh, and they've got all kinds of things, education resources, but also, importantly, they have a great page that summarises some of these platforms that are used the most and what they do. Common Sense Media is an American not-for-profit, a large not-for-profit, and they originally had the function of rating uh, movies and apps, so I highly recommend them as well. Um, they'll have lots of specific information on particular apps, and again, you can subscribe to their updates. Videogames.org is run by an Australian, Steve Dupont, whom we've worked with in the past quite a lot. Uh, you can get a free download of his book, that, that, uh, a PDF of it on his website there, and he covers um, all the ins and outs of video games and uh, why young people use, um, play video games, what the effects are, what some of the risks are. He talks about the dopamine effect um, of video games and how that affects the minds, the kind of psychology of young people and the physiology. So highly recommend that. Digital license, of course, is something we're very proud of at the foundation and is a glimpse into the world of, of young people and it's being run in in over 20, nearly 25% of schools across Australia, we've launched it in New Zealand. But you can go onto that website and get a little glimpse into it with a 10 question sample quiz. Um, so yeah, please go online and have a look at that. And for those of you who are a little bit more keen, these last two sites provide heaps of great information on parenting in the digital world. So this is the blog site for London School of Economics uh, run by Sonia Livingston. Um, basically, the world's one of the world's um, leading researchers into this area of, of digital and young people. So, please go online and have a look at that. They cover all kinds of topics in a very easy to read format, um, very informative. And Connect Safely is from our friends in the in the US, um, Ann Collier and Larry Majid. So, so please have a look at that one as well. Very similar to the the London School of Economics site in terms of addressing key topics and concerns for educators and parents. And if you, are, you know, if you are looking for some solutions for your, for your family in terms of how do you keep your devices coordinated and safe and, and how do you manage screen time, for example, I, I would highly recommend Family Zone. And the Alana Madeleine Foundation is a, um, a featured expert on the Family Zone website. So if you, if you log on and create an account, and cite us as your uh, inspiration for joining up, then uh, you'll get discounts and you'll get updates from our cyber safety experts, including myself. Here are some avatars from our digital license, which the uh, kids have responded to really, really favorably, and, and, and they, love, um, they love the challenge of the digital license. It's, it's, not, it's not always easy, and it does, it does challenge them to think. And we'd love your feedback, so if you have a moment, please give us some feedback on this webinar and for all the webinars during eSmart Week 2017. My name is Jeremy Blackman, and um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for listening. And we hope you've got lots of value out of today's webinar, and um, look forward to hearing about all the great eSmart activities going on in the community, from schools to libraries. Uh, and in all different settings. And um, until next webinar, or until I see you out in one of our Connect sessions that we run out in, in the community. And thank you for tuning in.